thank you for your time Ken maybe the first thing uh, we would like to hear plastic maybe you have some definition and some example and why do you believe it should be banned fantastic question and a very very important one too um well let's just take apart the word single-use plastic yeah. what does single use mean it means to use something only one time and what about plastic well what is plastic plastic is basically a mix of chemicals many of which are toxic and oil yeah. a great way that i like to explain this is uh is with food imagine uh roti roti biasa flatbread okay yeah, yeah. so when you make roti uh, flatbread you need salt flour and water yeah. well it are toxic and oil yeah. a great way that i like to explain this is uh is with food imagine uh roti roti biasa flatbread okay yeah, yeah. so when you make roti uh, flatbread you need salt flour and water yeah. well if you have only flour in your hand it's not bread it's just flour you need to mix them together and they create a bread uh, it's the same well it's very similar with plastics uh you have probably heard about the explosion in the usa in ohio about those very toxic chemicals well mm -hmm. those chemicals are used for making plastics, particularly PVC plastics. So when you have chemicals alone, they're just chemicals. But when you take the molecules of those and mix them with oil, it's very similar with plastics. Uh, you have probably heard about the explosion in the USA, in Ohio, about those very toxic chemicals. Well, those chemicals are used for making plastics particularly PVC plastics. So when you have chemicals alone, they're just chemicals. But when you take the molecules of those and mix them with oil molecules, then that's how you get plastics. Yeah. And so single use plastics are oil and chemical molecules put together to make something that is not intended for nature but it can only be used one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what people call the uh, virgin plastic, yeah. Uh, oil based, uh, oil based, uh, crude oil based uh, chemicals. Yeah. Yes, and that's something very important for people to know: is plastics aren't bad. It's just that plastics from oil and toxic chemicals are bad because they do not go back into the earth. If you want to have a farm with rice and trees and flowers, you don't put plastics in the ground. They're not going to do anything for the ground besides make it toxic. You need to have uh, something to put nutrition into the soil. And what I love about Indonesia and also Thailand is that scientists in these countries have already figured out how to make plant plastics. Whether we, uh, the choice is it is banned totally, uh, it is to manage the waste properly. You brought up some really good points. So, so far we have learned that there are two types of plastic. There are oil plastics and there are plant plastics. Yeah. However, plant plastics have a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, it's still being developed. The root cause of the problem is the behavior of using something only one time and throwing it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, in nature, we have a lot of one time products. When when a leaf falls from the tree and onto the ground, that is one time. But the systems that we have in nature, 
They are systems that are circular. When a flower falls to the ground or a fruit or a vegetable, it goes back into the ground as a nutrient and that can grow more life. Uh, this is why I'm a strong proponent of non-toxic bioplastics. But it's really important to know that not all bioplastics are safe. Some use toxic additives in yeah. order to, to, to create the plastic. So we need a lot more research. And I see Indonesia as being a world power for seaweed-based plastics. However, there will be, need to be a lot more uh, STEM programs, science programs at our high schools in Indonesia. We need to train Indonesians in engineering, mathematics, chemistry, so that we can leverage. Based on their size, you can distinguish between microalgae or phytoplankton and macroalgae, which is also known as seaweed, like giant kelp. Tackling the sargassum algal blooms in the Caribbean Sea. The Puerto Rico-based company is harvesting the surplus toxic algae to make useful products. Their extraction process upscales this type of brown seaweed into more sustainable alternatives for agricultural, cosmetic, and textiles industry. Our talent and innovate materials, just like the USA. When you innovate, that is where you get a strong economy. But right now, the economy of Indonesia is fossil, Indonesia is fossil fuels and oil, and that's something that I'll talk about later. And that's the reason why we need to ban plastics. And it, it's not just me saying this. It, it's not just me saying this. As a matter of fact, I believe in November, no, December, in major mainstream uh, news sources like Bloomberg and Reuters, there was a survey that people of the world, they want single-use plastics banned, but the powers that be are not allowing it. And so we have this question, okay, well, if we're forced to have single-use plastics, and if we're not able to have affordable options other than single-use plastics, then what can we do? And the and the the oil and the fossil fuel and the plastic companies, they are saying are saying, well, you have to do incineration, not recycling. No. Incineration. Yeah. If if you look at the words and the actions. If you look at the words and the actions of our leaders and the industry, their words are, everybody, let's recycle. But their actions are, we're going to make incinerators. So if, it is, if you implement incineration to, to, uh, to solve your landfill issue, that's, that's, that's wrong approach. But uh, basically, talking about incineration itself, uh, previously we had a standard uh, filter to keep at low level of pollution for these incinerations. Uh, how about now? Is, is the current standard is higher and incineration is not anymore recommended, recommended by the pure scientists? Or what do you say? Wow. Um, incineration is a complicated issue. Um, some scientists say that it's bad. Some scientists say that it's good. Oh. I think it's very important for people to exercise their critical thinking skills. Mm. Anybody can tell you anything. If you want to buy a car, the car salesman will tell you it's a great car, even if it isn't. So we need to learn about these issues so that we can separate the fake news from the real information yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah and there are organizations such as uh the i can't remember the name uh zero waste europe the global alliance for yeah, alternative I, generation I and like uh, of Gaia, uh, Global uh, Incineration Association in the U.S. Yes. 
Right. Uh, they are a, a global group of scientists and professionals who have already proven that incinerators are toxic. And not only that, but a recent study by the Zero Waste Europe, they found that making electricity from incineration creates far more CO2, climate changing gases, than making electricity from fossil fuels like natural gas. So it seems that if we think critically, incinerically, incineration is a technology that people don't want. It's a technology that the fossil fuel industry wants and scientists who are on the payroll of the fossil fuel industry. It's really important uh, to know about the difference between Sweden and Southeast Asia. Yeah. You see, two things, uh, the, uh, the climate and the politics. First of all, the climate. The air is very dry in Sweden. Yeah. However, the air is really wet in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but if you want to make a fire, it's better if the paper is dry. Mm. It's very difficult to put wet paper on a fire. Yeah. And so what happens with incineration in South Southeast Asia is that the machines are operated at lower temperatures, which means that more cancer-causing uh, emissions can come out of it and that can cause very expensive and life-threatening problems for people who inhale the smoke. And this is why in the United States of America, incinerators are not in white neighborhoods. No, they are in poor neighborhoods with people of color because white people do not want that toxic technology in their neighborhood. They don't want to breathe that air. So my government puts that toxic technology in less uh, influential neighborhoods. And I see the same thing happening throughout Southeast Asia. We have, we have uh, Asian governments who are saying, hey, incineration is working great in Sweden. Let's bring it over here. And because we are not as free as Americans and Europeans are in Asia, there's not much we can do about it. And then we have to breathe all of that toxic chemicals that come out of it. Uh, yeah, but uh, you mentioned something about our wet climate. So are you saying that uh, the toxic uh, risk is lower in the, in the countries with wet climate, like Southeast Asia? So, for incineration machines to run as safe as possible, mm -hmm. you, you have to burn all of the trash at a certain temperature. But incineration is a for-profit technology. It has, to be prof it has to be profitable because you need a lot of fossil fuels to power the machine, to, to make a lot of fire to burn the trash. And because... Southeast Asia's climate is very humid. Our waste has more water. And because our waste has more water, the incineration machine needs to use more fossil fuels ah. to, to make the fire stronger. Yes. And that makes the machine not profitable. Yeah, I see, I see. Yes, and you talked about downcycling. Uh, that's something very important to understand very well because uh, metal and glasses, they can be recycled infinitely. However, for plastics, plastics cannot be recycled, be recycled forever. They can only be recycled a short number of times before they have to be incinerated or buried in a landfill. However, however, uh, new news from the uh, plastics industry is that they, they claim they can make plastics 
infinitely recyclable. But what, what the public needs to know is that this is achieved through chemical recycling and chemical recycling pollutes our waterways. Like, you know, chemicals are liquids. And after you're done with a, a liquid, it has to go somewhere. And we are seeing chemical, uh, chemical recycling factories uh, being banned in some locations uh, throughout the West. Yeah. And where will these technologies end up? Most likely in other countries that have weaker environmental laws, such as the ones we see in Asia. And that's a, a really good point that you brought is, is downcycling. I mean, downcycling just prolongs the amount of time something will eventually end up into landfill. And that's why we need innovations of new materials that can go back into the ground while also reusing and refilling things as much as possible. So it's going to take a change of culture. Yeah. So maybe in generation, we should be focusing on how can we change our culture? And this is not something I think that, that, uh, that Indonesia can copy from Nepal or Thailand can copy from Korea or Germany can copy from the USA. We really need to think about ways that we can improve our society so that we have a zero waste or zero trash society as much as possible, at least. Well, let's. So let's talk about uh, pyrolysis. What is it? Uh, to give a cooking example, imagine that uh, you put rice in, in a tall pot and then you put a cover on the pot. Mm -hmm. Then you, you turn the heat on high below the pot. What's yeah. going to happen? Well, the, um, the, the heat is going to break apart the molecules of the rice and you're going to get a lot of smoke inside of the pot and mm. pressure is going to build up. Yeah. That what pyrolysis is. Pyrolysis uses extreme heat and pressure in, in a contained area with no oxygen to break apart the molecules of I see. unrecyclable uh, plastics. But the problem, the problem is that just like with incineration, it doesn't matter if it has filters or not because the laws of physics tell us that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. So yeah, yeah. In, in incinerators, uh, you get ash, you know, similar to, to when you barbecue. When you barbecue, you get that black powder at the bottom of the barbecue. Yeah. It's the same with pyrolysis and incineration. Yeah. For pyrolysis, it's called char, and it's very toxic, and it has to be contained. But what's happening is that the oil industry wants to put this toxic black powder in our roads, where it will eventually pollute our waterways. They want to, to make... Um, like things out of it that, that we use in society. And it shouldn't be used like that. It should be treated like nuclear waste, in my opinion. It needs to be contained and landfilled. So no matter what you do, plastic products end up landfilled. And if they're not landfilled in the ground, then they end up landfilled in our bodies as as microscopic dust called particulate matter or also microplastics. So pyrolysis is not a solution and it is a technology being promoted in the USA by ExxonMobil, one of the largest oil producers in the world. Yeah, I see, I see. Also how, it, that's how it works, yeah. And we also talk about energy recovery. What is, what, what sort of a solution uh, energy recovery that you mentioned energy recovery is is so stupid man uh energy recovery is is incineration it's the same thing only 
the only difference is that um, electricity is created from the steam of the trash after it's burned. Kind of like a, a windmill. You, uh, you know, um, in some countries, that they, they have a windmill. It, it spins around, and when the wind spins the blade around, there, there's, a, um, there's, there's like an alternator, the, the same thing in your car. It creates DC electricity. Um, it spins around, and there's magnets, and that's how you create electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a similar technology. So when, when the steam, um, when the toxic chemical steam in the incinerator um, rises, it spins these generators, and that creates electricity. But so it becomes turbine. Before mm -hmm. again, it, it becomes steam turbine. It, it, it is used to run steam turbine. Yes. So uh, waste waste to energy or energy recovery, or any word with the word recovery or power that has to do with waste is basically incineration. But it's incineration that makes a little bit of electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's actually what they call uh, WTE, the, the uh, waste to energy uh, solution. That's that basically incineration also. Yeah. Yes, and it's taking jobs away from waste pickers, people who, who go through the trash and take out recyclables. And it's also making it more difficult to recycle because governments are incentivized to burn plastics instead of recycle them because, like I said before, waste to energy, energy recovery, paralysis, and incineration, these are all for-profit toxic technologies. They need to have constant trash all the time. And that's a problem in Sweden. Uh, in, in Sweden, they're, they're taking trash from Norway and they're taking trash from other countries because those are for-profit machines the machines have to keep running which means the machine which means the machines are always creating toxic black uh ash that needs to be properly contained yeah because a couple of years ago i read about that even the united nations uh mentioned that uh, three of the 17 SDGs are met by solution like what they implement in uh, Sweden, the waste of energy. But that was a couple of years ago. Now, I think even the United Nations is not recommending it anymore, yeah. That's right. The more we learn about incineration and the more that we get fossil fuel uh, lobbyists out of our politics, the more we become informed and the more we learn the truth. And the truth is that we cannot continue a oil-based plastic world. We cannot continue a oil-based plastic world. We cannot continue a fossil fuel world. And there are many, many creative and amazing options that we have available. But it, it's difficult because we're fighting with very powerful industries. Yeah. So... So uh, we can say that if one or two decades ago they, they were promoting recycling, now uh, people are exposed that it's actually 9% of the plastic is actually can be recycled, economically enough to be recycled. Now as uh, the whole world, almost the whole world already aware of it, then they're promoting uh, incineration. <laughs> is, that, is that how we see it? Yes, and that is the that is the scary part. Like you said before, in only the USA since World War II, when my government brought plastics into action, yeah, from yeah. from from then until now, only nine percent of plastics have been recycled, and I think that's really scary because the majority of the world is not democratic. So if recycling is failing in the United States of America, 
what does that say for the rest of the world? And the answer is clear. Uh, it says that plastics are ending up in our ocean. Uh, a recent uh, study uh, found that 80% of ocean plastics are coming from Asia and Southeast Asia. And this is largely uh, due to politics, in, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, when, when, when a government does not provide waste management to people, they have only two options, litter or burn. And I think it's no surprise, or burn. And I think it's no surprise why we see so many uh, ocean plastics and also a lot of air pollution in the Global East as a result of this neglection of access to waste management, which is something we all should have. That should be a basic human right in the 21st century. Yeah. Well, we have exposed that history uh, in uh, our 14th, Tayangan uh, number 14, yeah, uh, about the history. It starts from the World War II, but uh, after the war is uh, over, then the whole petrochemical are uh, focusing to commercial and even promoting to the developing countries. But currently, I also, uh, I forget, I even read somewhere or I heard it from you that uh, even the plastic production are mostly in Asia currently. <laughs> they have built the petrochemical, we have petrochemical uh, factory also here in, in uh, Jakarta surrounding. So, yeah. Yes. World War II was a really big turning point for, for humanity. Uh, not only did it bring the U.S. Uh, to become a world power, as a lot of Europe uh, became bankrupt after the war, but we also see a rise of oil nations. So with most of Southeast Asia gaining their independence after World War II, we also see Southeast Asia rising up economically into middle-income countries. Yeah. But what a lot of people don't know is that rise in income in Southeast Asia came from fossil fuels. Some yeah. of the biggest fossil fuel governments in the world include China, India, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And in Indonesia, 50% of oil is drilled from Sumatra, and it's processed uh, in Singapore, in Thailand, and so we have this fossil, this very strong fossil fuel economy in a non, in a mostly non-democratic part of the world, where people find it very difficult to hold their governments accountable, and so. Again, like it, it makes sense why we see plastic production increasing, why we see oil production increasing, while why we see more plastics in the ocean, more climate change. Yeah. And when I look in the news, I see a lot of I see a lot, like ninety percent maybe, of news stories about America sending trash to Indonesia or Canada sending trash to Malaysia. But no one is talking about how the global east, the most popu the most populated part of the world, is a top plastic producer. How they have oil um, NOCs, national um, oil countries. That means that the government own oil production. We're, we're not talking about that, and yet we all share this planet. So. I really don't know how we're going to meet uh, sustainable development goals of cutting CO2 emissions in half if all eyes are only on the global north, but there's very little attention in Western media to the global south. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, anyway, the world has two major challenges now. Finding alternative, plant-based alternative, uh, develop them to to be able to one day replace our uh, fossil-based plastic. And another thing is uh, alternative, energy alternative <laughs> to replace this fossil base uh, we are using for many decades already. Okay, uh, Ken, it's been a uh, very rich discussion. Uh, we learned a lot from you. 
a very simple thinking, but uh, everything is makes sense. Uh, thank you for your time again. Uh, I think we are uh, our time is up. So next time, if we have uh, another chance, uh, we will make an, an, an appointment again. Okay. Thank you very much, Padmakasi. Thank you. Have a good day, Ken. Good, good to to meet you today. Thank you. Bye.